Hello everybody, I'm here to tell you about my vision for warfare and diplomacy in CK3 and I want to be clear right from the start. I'm of the opinion that the concept that I will be discussing in this video will never be implemented. Regardless of how you feel about it, make sure to keep this in mind so don't get too angry or too excited. This is mostly a mental exercise. Please consider this video more as an attempt to kick off a conversation about grand strategy and its relationship to war as a whole. And so, onwards. Let's talk about the system as it exists in the game right now. Warfare in CK3 is giving a number of people mixed feelings. On the one hand, everything that you need to know to be successful with it can be learned in this 16 minute video that I made ages ago. The barrier of entry is truly minimized in comparison to earlier titles. This is in and of itself excellent. If we compare CK3 system to CK2 system, we can see that the low entry hurdle of CK3 is caused primarily by outstanding UI work and the removal of unutilized mechanics. CK2 system with its sub-commanders, tactics and flank stacking had more options for players, but the truth is that these mechanics went heavily underutilized, with most players not even realizing that they existed in the first place or what to do with them. A deep game in which many mechanics can and will be ignored as none of it is required to succeed is a game that is out of its own depth. So in this sense, CK3 improved drastically. Accessibility and gameplay responsiveness must not be discounted whether you are a veteran or a beginner. Having a useless feature doesn't really help anybody. On the other hand, however, combat is nothing more than a solved mechanic in CK3. Once you grasp the fundamentals of how minute arms, commanders, knights and terrain modifiers work, there is of course still a chance of you making mistakes if you are sloppy, but you can absolutely and 100% of the time evaluate whether any given engagement would be a loss or a victory. This fact alone turns wars into chores rather than a life-defining experience for your character. And that's the problem. It's deeply troubling because it takes away the inherent risk of going to war and it can't be easily fixed. This very same problem existed in CK2 and with it in every single micro-based system. A micro-based warfare system, so a system in which you manually command your army stacks around, will always end up with a simple equation that determines victor and vanquished, optimal action and suboptimal action. Now the developers could address this, or at least a little bit. They could obfuscate certain mechanics, but hiding information from the player in general tends to lead to frustration as losses start feeling unjustified and victories feel like you were just lucky. More randomness also can't be the answer as this has been tried and tested and it failed in a major way. Many people won't remember this, but EU4 used to randomly select the terrain of a province when a fight would start. For example, a mountainous province would only have a chance to trigger an encounter in mountain terrain. There would always be a chance for hills, forest and so on. So this was, for obvious reasons, rather frustrating when you really needed that 60% chance for mountains and you got a forest instead. On top of all of this, there are various details that I could discuss here, such as Crusades being the single most irritating experience in this game, or how frustrating declaring wars for only one war goal at a time can be. There's also the question of historical accuracy of the levy system and the inflationary increase of army sizes as the game continues. However, ultimately, I firmly believe that dissecting details such as these misses the forest for the trees. The core issue causing all these things lies much deeper. The core issue is also, sadly, a core principle of grand strategy war design. Warfare is a minigame. The way players interact with warfare is on an entirely separate layer compared to the rest of the gameplay. Almost every action that you can possibly take in CK3 ties back strongly to character roleplay. The dev team improved marvelously on CK2's weaknesses in this area by introducing the stress system, making it so that your character's identity genuinely matters. Everywhere outside of warfare. Of course, warfare bases its fundamental numbers on character interactions as well. The amount of troops and the amount of money that you have to buy mercenaries or men at arms are based on the relationship you have with your vassals, at least sometimes. However, even this is a pure numbers game rather than the intricate reality of personal relationships that accompanied early feudal systems. Everything else in Warfare is utterly disconnected from CK3's core gameplay concept. A character may hate you after you killed their five children, but you can still select them as a knight or commander, and they will do everything in their power to bring you victory. After all, all that matters are their numbers. Their entire character is meaningless for this. Not a single of your army movements is ever informed by roleplay, but rather because you know you can bait the AI into, for example, attacking you in favorable terrain, or because you know you might capture a valuable prisoner that lets you win the war quickly. Sieging down a specific location may superficially seem like an authentic character decision, but none of them are actually truthfully motivated by roleplay. It is simply a player interaction with the arcade system of knowing where to get prisoners, how to defeat an army, and how to trap the AI. 
you can go ahead and make a zealous commander sack the papal states and it is all the same to them. You can make your commander destroy their best friend, sibling or spouse by having them conquer their territory and they won't think ill of you at all. You can literally march people you hate with no backup into enemy troops and they will simply do it and die because, again, character gameplay does not matter in CK3's warfare. The greatest flaw of CK3 warfare is not that authenticity is not perfect or that the AI can be irritating. It's the fact that this gameplay system is an essential part of a game that defines itself as a story generator, but it generates no stories whatsoever. To approach and fix this issue, one has to think outside of the box. As long as Warfare is a minigame that relies on you solving the equation of winning battles, the optimal choice is always to set aside roleplay and simply put whoever is best into the commander position. A new Warfare system would have to be an integral part of CK3's core design idea, story generation. It is self-evident that a player wants to win a war, I mean, that is the point of starting a war, right? But from a design standpoint, the war itself must carry a story rather than simply function as a tool to see who wins and who loses. For everything that you are about to see, I took Victoria 3's warfare concept as an inspiration. We cannot apply any of Victoria 3's ideas unaltered to CK3, seeing how different the focuses of these games are, but Victoria 3's system is the first one to consider itself more than just a minigame. While it is impossible to say how well its implementation will actually work, the design addresses the aforementioned core weakness of CK3's system. Whether you win or lose is trivial compared to the impact your society has on the war and that then cycles back from the bloody frontline to your society. By removing micro-warfare, the lever that let the player avoid any consequences for fighting a war has been eviscerated. Instead of fooling the AI and winning at a much smaller cost than is sensible, the player now gets to decide whether they are fine with whatever impact a prolonged war will have on their society. This is a dramatic departure from Victoria 2, but it finally embeds warfare within the society and economy simulator that, well, is the Victoria series. Now, CK3 is not an economy or a society simulator. It is a character roleplay and nobility simulator instead, which means that war, its mechanics and its results must be informed by and must inform these exact core elements. So how do we actually do this? I have developed three pillars of war that the following concept stands on. Number one, characters matter. This is the first and most important pillar. The warfare system must understand itself as a part of the mechanics driven by characters rather than a minigame that merely exists to find out who wins or loses a conflict. From start to finish, it must be character interactions that drive this system. Number two, warfare means campaigning. To go to war in the Middle Ages meant to organize a campaigning force. The nature of wars changed drastically throughout CK3's era and differed from region to region, so certain degrees of abstraction so that everything fits in are absolutely necessary. For example, historically, campaigns only occurred in certain time periods of the year. As a gameplay mechanic, this would disrupt the gameplay loop too much and leave too much of the year with you basically doing nothing. So this one can be abstracted. Wherever possible, however, a mechanic should always be focused around the topic of planning and executing campaigns to capture the genuine nature of military campaigns in the medieval era. Number 3. War is costly. A major topic of contention for the lords and ladies of this period was the question of who should pay for campaigns, how they would pay for them, and why they would pay for them. In the early Carolingian system, every free man was obligated to serve in campaigns of the king. This model would be substituted in different ways over time. The English implemented a scutage system that allowed vassals to simply pay money instead of needing to participate in a campaign. This would then allow the central authority figure, so the king, to maintain their own forces or pay mercenaries. The French crown bound its vassals tightly to itself by instituting firm troop obligations, whereas the king of the Germans relied on their warrior bishops as steady troop providers for a long time and otherwise had to broadly rely on consent of their subjects for campaigns. The more centralized Eastern Roman Empire, on the other hand, had an intricate and evolving system of centralized imperial forces, themes and akritai. Marches, in general, were used in all forms and shapes in Europe, Africa and Asia, denoting the lords of certain areas as obligated to defend these lands proactively. As time in the game passes, rather than building infinite sacks of minute arms or boosting the stats into space, the distribution of campaigns' costs and where troops come from and who they listen to ought to be in the focus of gameplay, because it will give you a very different experience early on compared to later on. So here we have them. Characters matter, warfare means campaigning, and war is costly. With these pillars in mind, let's explore what a war might look like. Initially, one would choose a Casus Belli in a similar fashion to how we do it right now. However, rather than start the war immediately, this would open up a campaign planning window that should remind you of Victoria 3's diplomatic plays. 
the two primary actors here, so the person that initiated the campaign and the person that is the target of the campaign will be shown. They each will have a troop number as well as a campaign fund. The initial troops and funds are those owed via vassal contracts as well as those of their own domain. These numbers will depend primarily on the societal setup of their realm. Are they a strongly centralized realm in which their vassals either owe them troops or in which they maintain a strong army by virtue of the Skutash obligations? Or is this number tiny as the realm may be very very decentralized or even tribal and war participation would rely on other factors such as prestige, consent and so on. On top of this number, all of their respective vassals will be shown, primarily pointing all those out that could be persuaded to directly participate in this engagement. While most vassals would most likely simply owe a number of troops or money, some vassals, a marquis for example that is holding a borderland, may be obligated to come to the aid of their liege. Other times, should there be no obligation, they might just be willing to join the campaign simply because they want to help their liege, maybe because the used Casus Belli brings them benefits or threatens their very own territory, or because they like their liege or hate the enemy. Other times, however, a vassal may be willing to attend the fighting personally and with their household troops if there is something in it for them. Here is where character negotiation comes into play. There are almost infinite options here. The liege may hand out hooks, add Casus Belli's to the war that please certain vassals, hand out pardons, release prisoners, hand over money, artifacts, marriages, vassal contract changes, counties, new vassal titles, grand lower tier vassals or even use a hook on the other person should they have one. Each side of a conflict only has a certain amount of maneuvers that they can spend in this phase on utilizing favors and such to call in their vassals. If you have outstanding relationships with your vassals and are a beloved ruler, you may not even have to use a maneuver and they will want to join you voluntarily, you just have to accept. The higher one's title rank, the more maneuvers one gets. If a player's liege goes to war, a player vessel might just mark acceptable offers that their liege could make and should the liege be willing and in need of such a deal, they could commit to it. Once this phase is over, the external campaign planning phase begins. This phase is indeed quite similar to the first phase, but is aimed at external realms and their vassals. All relevant external realms and their vassals, how exactly it is determined whether a realm is relevant or eligible to join this war is something that would be in the nitty gritty of creating such a system, so I can't exactly tell you, would be listed in a similar fashion, showing those willing to join you freely and those to join you if you sweeten the deal a bit. Again, much like before, people with an obligation to aid you, so people with alliances, family bonds and so on, could be invited without using any of your maneuvers, whereas each ruler of the external realms that you persuade would cost you one. In this phase, in general, very few maneuvers should be available to the campaign attacker and defenders to avoid needless world wars. Now, once this phase ends, the sides have been established and all that remains is for one of the primary participants to back off and give up the selected primary CB, or, should nobody back down, the campaign will launch at the end of it. Now, how a campaign actually proceeds is something that would have to be tried, tested and altered to see what truly works as a well-rounded system. It is impossible to conceive of a working prototype without, well, being able to prototype it. What must be clear, however, is that there would be no army micro, but instead regional theaters or so goes my suggestion. The campaign is given primary war goals thanks to whatever CBs are in use. The player can then prioritize certain target counties or duchies and the characters accompanying the players on this campaign will give advice on which locations to conquer, whether one ought to plunder the surrounding area, whether an army should split to assault different locations and so on. The longer two opposing armies spend within one duchy, the more small skirmishes and then of course larger battles will occur. Every lost battle, lost castle and so on will create campaign exhaustion. Holding the war goal will create campaign exhaustion for the enemy. Not listening to your allies' advice or heeding the advice of someone others view as unqualified should impact how your allies feel about you and one another. Should a decision that you or one of your allies made lead to a negative campaign experience and with that to campaign exhaustion, this should also bring disrepute to the person that made the decision. Once campaign exhaustion is high enough, characters will give up on the CBs relating to them. This means that you can either have a complete victory, complete defeat or various levels between them. All in all, I believe that no ruler should be permitted to join an ongoing campaign or otherwise things would quickly escalate too much and feel uncontrollable for the player. Any character that wants to utilize a Casus Belli against one of the two fighting powers may launch their own campaign, potentially forcing the newly attacked side to split their resources and try to get some of their vassals and allies to help them out, potentially not being able to bring their full force. In the end, whether you win or lose, you will feel differently about all those that supported you and led to success or disaster potentially creating lifelong friendships or rivalries. There is an incredible amount of things that can be tried in such a system that are impossible within our old microsystem. This system would bring a flexible war declaration, alliance, negotiation and obligation system to the game. 
It would also enable you to make promises in exchange for support from outside and inside forces or write the obligation to support you proactively into the feudal contracts of your vassals rather than needing their goodwill. Going to war as a tribal ruler in a society in which cooperation rests on the shoulders of honor, trust and friendship will feel very differently from a centralized kingdom such as England in which the king has a large guaranteed force in his very own hands as his vassals are obliged to pay scutage. Centralizing your realm would no longer simply mean more troops and lead to troop inflation, but drastically shift where those troops come from, who owns them and how freely you can use them. If, for example, your supporting vassals in a war are bishops, much like they were for the German kings and emperors, your obligations and privileges will be significantly different from someone that rules through cooperation with a select few powerful dukes. The actual campaigns then involve all those genuinely involved in the war rather than your entire empire and the chemistry in your campaign leadership will determine not just the outcome of the war but the continuation of your lives. This system could also form coherent and cooperative large-scale campaigns such as the struggle of the Crusades where everybody pitches in and then one coherent campaign can be launched or the wars between the Seljuks and the Eastern Roman Empire. Characters matter, warfare means campaigning and war is costly. It's all in here. Now to give this video a conclusion, I personally do not at all believe that this system will ever even be considered to be implemented into CK3. There are too many underlying systems such as levies, income, war funding, campaign planning, casus belli, feudal contracts, government transition, factions, rebellions and so on and so on that rely on our current system. I have had the pleasure to talk to a number of developers behind the game and I believe them all to be passionate and dedicated, but changing the old warfare system to something like this would make Stellaris FTL update look like a piece of cake. I just don't see it. However, I wish it was possible. Let me know what you think about this idea. As much as I love it, maybe you feel very differently about it. If you got any questions, clarifications or feedback, let me know in the comments. For now, I will see you later. Alligator.